I'm going to ask you to take God's word, find the book of Ephesians this morning, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. This morning I'm going verse by verse through the book of Ephesians, we're in chapter 4. I'm in part 3 of a message I've entitled, Living by the Spirit. I want to welcome our Facebook and friends and family that have joined us this morning uh, to worship through the word, and we're going to get right into that. I want to give a little recap as we get started this morning, uh, and if you're taking notes in the outline, you can follow along with me today. And we'll do that in just a moment as we get kicked off. Living by the Spirit. Living by the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 4. We'll read verses 31 and 32 this morning. April 15th, 2017 ushered in a historical milestone. On a day that most of us can't even recall, Emma Morano died in Italy at the age of 117 years old. None of us knew her, but she was the last known person born in the 19th century. Although the 1800s were a long time ago, this quiet passing reminds us that a time comes for each generation to pass off the scene when the last remaining person will die. Life is fleeting, so we need to be intentional in how we live. There's coming a day that we will leave this life and, and that our physical lives down here will end. For believers, we have eternal life. Uh, because of the Lord Jesus that saves us and because of the Holy Spirit that seals us. We have life by the Spirit and we are to live our lives in the Spirit. Paul has taught the importance of the control of the Spirit of those who have life by the Spirit. When the Spirit controls our lives, He will affect, he will affect how we relate to others, how we respond to others, and how we are a resource for others. In verses 25 through 29, Paul speaks about the control of the Spirit. We need to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. In the last study, we began to talk about the command. Paul gave a command about the Spirit. He commands the believers in their relation to the Spirit. How are we to relate to the Spirit? He tells us in verse 30 that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. In verse 30, we also learn he addressed our redemption and the Holy Spirit. What part does the Holy Spirit have in our redemption? Now, we noted last week that we are redeemed by the Son of God. It was Jesus that paid the price for us on the cross. We're redeemed by the Son, but we're also sealed by the Spirit. Now, let me say this as clear as I know how. I said it last week. I want to reemphasize that today. If you, have, if you are not sealed with the Spirit, you are not saved by the Son. Romans 8, verse 9, I put this on the screen. Listen to Romans 8, verse 9. The Bible says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So if you've not been born again by the Spirit, you've not been saved. To be saved is to be sealed. So let's continue to examine this command uh, about our Lord and the Holy Spirit as we continue talking about living by the Spirit. If you're physically able, I'm going to ask you to honor the God, reading of God's Word by standing with me as we honor His reading of the Word of God this morning. And I pray that the Holy Spirit, as we preach about Him this morning, and that He will touch hearts today and change lives today. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. The Bible says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you you may be seated this morning father what an awesome privilege I have to preach your word today just get me out of the way and Lord fill me with the spirit of God again that I might speak and say all that you'd have me to say no more no less today Lord, I pray you'd speak by your Holy Spirit this morning through your Holy Word today. Draw people to yourself today. Lord, I pray that we would each examine our lives and ask that question, are we living by the Spirit? Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit will work mightily in this place. Break down barriers, break through things that have been put up, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray you'd break through hard hearts. And God, that we would not only receive your forgiveness, but God, we would forgive others as we have been forgiven. Lord, help us to practice these principles. And Lord, help us to repent where we need to repent, restore where we need to restore. Let us re be revived, Lord, by the Holy Spirit of God. Do a work in this place today by your grace and by your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible tells us of 
our relation to him. We've talked about that last week. Then we learned about our redemption in him. Now in C, in your outline, I want to say a word today about our removal, our removal through him. It is by the Holy Spirit that there are some things that are removed from our lives. Thank God for that. Our removal. What are, what are we to remove? Well, Paul uh, gives a de detailed list of what some things that are to be to remove. Notice what is to be removed in verse 31 again. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. Then he says, with all malice, all these things are to be put away. Uh, so Paul lists six carnal vices that are to be removed. And then later he'll give three Christ-like virtues that are to be revealed. Believers are exhorted to let all these things be put away, to be done away, to be repudiated out of our lives, to get, get rid of them. We are not to love it. We're not to live by these things. We are not to let any bitterness take root in our hearts, our minds. We are not to harbor the least bit of bitterness or resentment in our lives toward others. Through the, listen to me, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can remove all bitterness from us. That's the only way we can do it. We need, to, we need the Holy Ghost touch, amen. I'm telling you, we need the Holy Spirit to move and change our lives. <laughs> Let all bitterness, that word bitterness means a smoldering resentment, a brooding grudge-filled attitude. The word means a bitter hatred, extreme wickedness, and resentfulness. It is usually characterized by an unforgiving spirit and a desire for revenge or retribution. Let all bitterness be gone. Warren Wiersbe said that bitterness refers to a settled hostility that poisons the whole inner man. Somebody does something we don't like, so we harbor ill will against him. Bitterness and anger usually over trivial things make havoc of homes, churches, and friendships. We're to put away bitterness from us. Don't let bitterness settle in your hearts. Don't let bitterness corrupt your mind. Don't let bitterness ruin your life. It will do that. Pastor Glenn Spencer in his commentary on Ephesians said this about bitterness. Listen to this. He said, let's keep in mind that bitterness is always self-inflicted. Bitterness is not something that someone can do to you. Only we can do it to ourselves. Bitterness is anger in its most poisonous stage. It is a deep-seated anger that has stewed deep down inside until its poison now rules the heart. It is the most dangerous form of anger. Someone said resentment is like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. <laughs> Amen. He said, he said bitterness is destructive and deadly. And it is. It'll kill you. We're to put away all bitterness. How are you doing with that this morning? Is there any bitterness in your heart? Hebrews 12, 15 says, Don't let any root of bitterness spring up defiling many. Don't let any little root of bitterness... It'll grow. It'll choke the life out of you. We're to put away all bitterness. He said also we're to put away wrath. That Greek word thumos is the Greek word means boiling with anger, indignation, fierceness, rage, a violent outburst is what it means. It's an explosion on the outside of feelings that are on the inside. This word describes a violent outburst of anger. I mean, it may flare up and it may subside, but like, let me tell you, it leaves behind carnage in its wake, amen? <laughs> it leaves behind hurt and pain. We do things we shouldn't do when we say things we shouldn't say when we've got wrath. I had to look this up and read that. It was, it was astounding me. This, I read this story. I had to go look it up and make sure it was right. In 1894... The Baltimore Orioles came to Boston to play a routine baseball game. But what happened that day was anything but routine. The Orioles' John McGraw got into a fight with the third baseman, the Boston third baseman. And then within minutes, all the players from both teams were in a brawl. It didn't stop there. Uh, the brawl spilled over into the, the grandstands amongst the fans, and they went to fight him. Somehow someone set fire to the stands and the entire ballpark burned to the ground. Wow. To top that off, not only that, but the fire spread to 107 other Boston buildings that day. The nine alarm fire caused no fatalities, thank goodness, but burned more than 12 acres, destroying, listen, about 200 buildings valued at more than $300,000 which was a lot of money in 1894. 
listen, a total of 1,900 people were left homeless because of that fight that started on the field. Do you have anger and wrath issues today? Do you lose your temper and lash out in anger today? Uh, it'll not do you any good, and it not do those who love you, those who are around you any good. Your anger don't do you any good. Well, it makes me feel better. <laughs> no, it don't. Really, after you get through it, you say, boy, I acted like a fool. It makes you really makes you feel bad. It makes you ashamed of yourself, and you should be. We must deal with our anger immediately and not let the sun go down on our anger. We're not to give the devil a place in our life or a foothold. What, what he taught, already told us about if we're living by the Spirit, we'll put away all bitterness and all wrath. We'll put away all anger. That word anger is a different word in the Greek from, from the word wrath. The word wrath is the word thumos. This word for anger is the word orge. It means uh, a more settled or abiding condition of a person's heart. Uh, the word comes from a word that means to choke and to strangle and to vex. That's what it means. Uh, it, uh, Webster's Dictionary defines it like this, a violent passion of the mind excited by a real or supposed injury, usually accompanied with a propensity to take vengeance or to obtain satisfaction from the offending party. We'll get them. They're going to get what's coming to them. Hey, don't let anger rule your life and ruin your life and ruin your testimony for Jesus. We're to put away all bitterness and wrath and anger from us. Read this story this week on October the 6th, 2019. An unidentified man in Phoenix, Arizona became angry at his upstairs neighbors when they were making too much noise. Around 11.20 p.m., he tried banging on their door, but to no avail, it didn't, didn't calm him down, didn't, didn't help the situation any. So the man took matters into his own hands. He returned to his apartment, and he took his gun and fired several shots into the ceiling. One round ricocheted upstairs and come back and hit him in the face. No one else was injured, but the shooter was taken to the hospital in a critical condition. There's a good reason that anger... Is just one, lower, one letter short of danger. <laughs> Amen. We often do foolish things and harmful things in our anger. We're to put away all bitterness, wrath, and anger. Hey, are you controlled by anger? Say, are you known as a hothead? Boy, don't mess with them. They'll lose their cool. <laughs> can I tell you, you need to lose your life and die to yourself so that Jesus can live in you and through you, living by the Spirit. <laughs> We're to put away all bitterness, wrath, anger. We're also to put away clamor. What does that word mean, clamor? It means a shout or an outcry or strife and reflects the public outburst that reveals loss of control. Man, you see a lot of clamor on the streets in these cities on TV, don't we? In our day and age, there's a clamor. people are full of clamor today. Webster's Dictionary defines that word clamor as a great outcry, noise, an exclamation made by a loud human voice continued and repeated. It often expresses complaint and urgent demand. I want my way. You've offended me. <laughs> that, that's where they are. They lose control. A, an angry person is often loud. Now, when I get up here and preach, I'm loud, but I'm not angry. <laughs> I have told you before when I've gotten angry preaching, and I've had to repent of that. Have you preached angry before, preacher? Yes, I've told you. I, I'm not preaching angry now. Most of the time I preach, I'm not angry. Amen. <laughs> and when I have been angry, I've had to repent. An angry person, those loud, and they make a lot of noise. Lehman Strauss said that clamor is the audible expression of anger, wrath, and bitterness in the heart. It is the cry of one's passions and railing against others while asserting one's own rights. On June 28th, 1838, 18-year-old Victoria was crowned queen of, Eng uh, queen of Britain, and her reign as queen lasted 63 years and seven months, longer than any other British monarch. At age 20, she married Prince Albert, who not only was her husband, but also became a close a political advisor. Shortly after his marriage to Queen Victoria, Albert and Victoria got into an embroiled quarrel there. And so what he did with his new bride, he was in a fight. <laughs> you ever been there? No, 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 don't no confess right now, I mean. <laughs> but that's where they were. They were in a quarrel. So he stormed out to his room and locked himself in his own private apartment. 
Victoria followed suit, followed in his footsteps, came to his door furiously, banging on his door. Albert said, who's there? The Queen of England. And she demands to be admitted. No response. Victoria hammered again on the door. Who's there? She said, the Queen of England. Still no response. Victoria was growing more furious by the minute, hammered again and again to no avail. And finally she stopped. And there was a pause. And then she gently tapped on the door. Albert said, who's there? She said, your wife, Albert. And the queen was admitted in promptly. Most quarrels are just not worth it and are best dropped. We need to get rid of clamor. If you want to, your walk to match your talk, get rid of the anger, the wrath, and the clamor. We're to put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, that word evil speaking, our English, that translates into Greek blasphemia. And we get our word blaspheme from that Greek word. We, we're not, we all know we're not to take the name of the Lord in vain. We're not to blaspheme our Lord. But the word also means to slander or in, injure another person's good name. To blaspheme or rail against another person. We're not to speak evil of anyone. Such conversations are toxic and destructive. James 1 verse 26 James says this, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Has the Holy Spirit got control of your mind and your mouth? Have you put away evil speaking? Do you talk bad about others? Repent. Confess it to God. Ask God to forgive you. He may lead you to go to that person and say, would you please forgive me? I've been bad. I've said something I shouldn't have said about you. And if they got Christ in them, they'll forgive you. Whether they forgive you or not, you, uh, you'll feel better. Amen. <laughs> you, get, you get right with Jesus. The sixth vice he tells us to put away is malice. We're to put away all malice. We're not to allow any malice in our hearts and lives. What does that word malice mean? It means badness or wickedness or uh, malignity. It means a, a maliciousness. Webster's uh, defines this word malice as extreme enmity of heart or, or a disposition to injure others without cause for mere personal gratification or from a spirit of revenge, unprovoked malignity or spite. So we talk down, we, we talk down to others. We look down on others because it might, make us, it might lift us up, make us feel good about ourselves. He said, put away all malice, maliciousness, wickedness from us. The word is a general term referring to an evil force that destroys relationships. And it can mean anything from trouble to wickedness. It is a deliberate attempt to harm another person. Let me say as clear as I know how today that Jesus, followers of Jesus Christ are not to harm and do harm to others. And be, we're, we're not to be intentionally evil to others. We're not filled with or led by the Holy Spirit when we have bitterness, when we have wrath or anger or clamor, or evil speaking, or malice in our hearts. So Paul tells us what is to be removed from the Christian's life. When we live by the Spirit, we'll put off these things in our lives. The Holy Spirit will guide us. So we, we learn what is to be removed. Notice in verse 31 again, before I move on, I want to say a word about where it is to be removed. He said, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. To be put away. So in dealing with these six carnal vices, uh, Paul uses the aorist tense in the Greek language, which means it's to once and for all be put away. We're to put away bitterness, wrath, uh, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and malice from us. I'm talking about victory in Jesus. Amen. I mean, if he saved us, he set us free. He's given us eternal life. Hallelujah. He's given us the victory. We're to remove these things from us. The word put away, I, t I told you it was an heiress, but it's also an imperative. An heiress imperative carries with a sense of um, immediacy and urgency. It could tr be translated, do it now, or don't delay. And what amazes me, we don't see this in the English, but the word's passive in the Greek language. It's a passive voice that means let it be put away from you. That means an outside force acts upon the subject. That means the things that's in us, we can't put away by ourselves. You ain't got it in you to stop it. I'm going to do a New Year's resolution, Brother Ray. You will fail. You have failed. I have failed. So you don't know about me. I got a lot of resolve. You still fail. Oh, yeah. I, I'm not trying to discourage you. You need, some out, you need some outside help. 
You need the Holy Spirit help. That's what that word passive is. Let the things be put away from you. So when we're living by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to take that old bitterness and do away with it. Uh, that old anger and wrath and do away with it. He's going to change our disposition. Hallelujah. It is as we yield to the Holy Spirit that He sanctifies us in our lives and He removes those things from our lives. Living by the Spirit. That's what I'm preaching on this morning. We need every Christian to live by the Holy Spirit. John MacArthur said this. Listen to this. This is a great, very important word he gave. He said this. These particular sins involve conflict between person and person, believer and unbeliever, and worse still, believer between believer and believer. These are the sins that break fellowship and destroy relationships, that weaken the church and mar its testimony before the world. When an unbeliever sees Christians acting just like the rest of society, the church is blemished in his eyes, and he is confirmed still further in resisting the claims of the gospel. So I, I need that, Jesus. He ain't made no change in your life. <laughs> Y'all just like me. Y'all just like the folks down at the bar. Y'all just like my family. Have you put away these carnal vices from you? Paul tells us in, in the command about the Spirit, we've learned how we, are, how we relate to him. We've learned about our redemption in him. Then I preached this morning about our removal by him. By him, he, we are able, enabled to remove these things out of our lives. Then lastly, D in your outline, I want you to notice our response by him. If we're living by the Spirit, we're going to respond by him. How are we going to respond? Notice what we give. Paul lists three things, what we give. Three Christ-like virtues that we are to give. He tells us we're to give kindness, tenderness, and forgiveness. That's right there. It's in the text. And be kind to one another. See that in verse 32? And be kind to one another. So Paul uses the durative case in the Greek, which speaks of an ongoing action. That means Christians, you and I, are to be ongoingly kind. <laughs> that means we can't take a day off from being unkind. We don't ever have an excuse of not being kind. If you can't say something that's not kind, don't say it at all. <laughs> Amen. Say, I don't have that. I ain't said nothing, but I got feeling. Well, deal with them. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Deal with them by the Holy Spirit. Be kind. These qualities are produced in us and through us by the Holy Spirit. And they are evidences that we are living by the Spirit. The word there, be, is a present imperative. It's a commandment. And be kind, it means uh, it speaks of a new lifestyle. Keep on becoming kind. That's what it means. Keep on becoming kind. It's a middle voice. It calls for the subject, us, uh, to initiate the action. So we, as Christians and Christ followers, have it in us to be kind. Amen. And we got to choose to be kind. Now, I don't feel like being kind. Deal with your feelings. Put, it, put that feeling down and do what God calls you to do. I'd rather be obedient than o obedient to the Father instead of obedient to my feelings. Amen. Be kind, that word means gracious. Uh, it carries the idea of being gentle and courteous and caring. So Christians are to be known for their kindness. Christ followers are to be Christ-like, and Jesus was kind to others. Have you ever known some Christians that mean they're meaner than a junkyard dog? You don't want to be around them. You want to run from them. Put them guys in a fence. Let them bark <laughs> until they get right. <laughs> woof, 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 woof. I'm trying to behave myself. We're to be kind to our spouses. We're to be kind to our children. We're to be kind to our parents. We're to be kind to our loved ones. We're to be kind on our jobs. We're to be kind to our employees. We're to be kind to our employers. We're to be kind at school to our teachers and to our students. We're to be kind to our friends. We're to be kind to our enemies. Whoo, preacher, that's a hard one. Be kind to your enemies. We're to be kind to all. So it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5.22. It says this in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness. Are you known for your kindness today? If you are not known for kindness, then you are not known for Christ's likeness. We're to put on Christ's kindness. That's the evident in our lives. Secondly, he tells us to put on tenderness. Look what it says there. Be tenderhearted. The word means to show compassion and mercy, understanding, love, and tenderness and warmth. It means to be aware of a person's hurt and sufferings and problems and difficulties, emotions, and their mental state, 
in their physical and spiritual condition. And our hearts are to go out to them. Compassion in genuine sensitivity and heartfelt sympathy for the needs of others. So that means we've got to get the focus off of us. Amen. The world don't revolve around you. The world don't revolve around me. The world revolves around Jesus. Amen. And get our eyes focused on him and others. I tell you, I tell you before, that true joy, and if you want to use that acronym, J, Jesus, O, others, and Y, you. Jesus first and us last, amen, and others right there in the middle. <laughs> We're to keep that focus. We, we feel for others' needs and hurts and struggles, and our hearts go out to them, and we move to help as the Holy Spirit leads us. Tender-hearted, by the way, is the opposite of hard-hearted. Amen. We're not to be rough and uncaring, unloving, unmoved, and indifferent towards others. We're to, be, we're to give kindness and tenderness to others. How are you doing in that? Are you giving out kindness? Are you giving out showing tenderness to others in their need? Are we compassionate toward those who are lost, those who are in need, those who are undone? We're to also give forgiveness not only kindness, tenderness, but also forgiveness. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Wow. So Paul instructs the church to be forgiven of one another. Do you mean to tell me that Christians have to forgive one another? Yes. That's what the Bible's telling us. Christians are not perfect, by the way. Newsflash, we're not perfect. We are not sinless in this life. There will be times that we fail one another. There will be times when we hurt one another. There will be times that we don't, we're, we're not Christ-like towards one another. We, we will need forgiveness from our Lord, but we'll need forgiveness from others as well. And you and I are to be forgiven others. You know why? Because sometimes they're going to hurt you. Sometimes they're going to disappoint you. And you're going to have to give forgiveness to them as well. Uh, we're to forgive one another. Be forgiving. The word means to be gracious to a person, to pardon him for some wrong done. David Jeremiah said, don't forget what Paul is doing in this entire section of Ephesians. He's pointing out that Christians are to be radically different from the worldly culture they live in. In the world, it's every man for himself. Claw your way to the top. Look out for numero uno. Do what you have to do to get what you want. Success is the primary virtue. So everything is justified by means to that end. Because Christ was not like that, the, his Holy Spirit would never lead any Christian to be anything but kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. He says, and in our world, that is radical living. But in God's world, it is simply the norm. End of quote. Do you have anything against anyone today? Forgive them. Let it go. Forgive them. And we're going to talk about why you should do that in just a minute. Unforgiveness is like poison or a cancer that will destroy you. We cannot walk with the Holy Spirit and, and live by the Spirit with unforgiveness and bitterness in our hearts. Unforgiveness. Listen to this statement. In the life of a Christian or a local church, fellowship will grieve the Holy Spirit and render our worship and our work and our witness ineffective, unproductive, and powerless. Paul tells us what we give. We give kindness. We give Tenderness, we give forgiveness. Then Paul tells us, he reminds the believers right here in verse 32, what we got. He's going to tell us what we got, what we have received as believers. What did we get? He gives, first of all, the example. Uh, A, in your outline, he gives the example of his forgiveness. Look in verse 32. Even as God. So Paul reminds the believers that we have received we have received forgiveness from God in Christ. He points to God, the example of God's forgiveness. Even as. That means just in the same way as. You mean God wants us to, to forgive just like he forgave? Yes. Wow. And the, just like, according to, to the degree that he forgave. There is no greater example of forgiveness anywhere, at any time, by anyone than God's forgiveness. Psalm 103, verse 12, the Bible says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's a long way, amen. Thank God our transgressions are gone in Jesus. Woo! Samuel Davies wrote a poem. Listen to this. It's a good poem. I'll put it on the screen. Pardon from an offended God. Pardon for sins of deepest dye. Pardon bestowed through Jesus' blood. Pardon that brings the rebel nigh. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who has grace so rich and free? Oh, may this glorious matchless love, this godlike miracle of grace... Teach mortal tongues like those above to raise this song of lofty praise. Who is a pardoning God like thee? 
Or who has grace so rich and free? Have you been forgiven by God? Hey, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? And are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? God calls us to be forgiven of others even as God has forgiven us. Listen, Paul doesn't lower the expectations, but he gives the greatest possible example of all as he exhorts us believers to be forgiven of one another. If these Christian virtues were practiced by professing believers, there would be no church splits, no church fights or fusses. Uh, if they were, they'd be quickly mended, amen. And bitterness, there wouldn't be no bitterness between God's people. What would happen? The world would take note and great credibility would be gained in the power of the gospel to change lives. The effectiveness of the preaching of the gospel and the witness of God's people would be widespread and ongoing. We wouldn't be stifled and st stunted. Paul gives the greatest example of, his, of forgiveness. Then notice he gives a, the extent, verse 32, he talks about the extent of his forgiveness. What was the extent? He said, even as God in Christ forgave you. It cost God a great deal to forgive us. In Christ, it conveys the idea of through Christ. It means Jesus is the means and instrumentality through which the Father can now forgive us. The extent of God's forgiveness is seen in the cross of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of the sinless Son of God. Jesus paid the ultimate price. I've got good news for you. 2,000 years ago, Jesus took your sin on Calvary's cross. On himself, he died. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And by the way, the Lord doesn't, the Lord doesn't forgive us partially. The Lord doesn't forgive us temporarily. The Lord doesn't forgive us conditionally. When we come to Jesus, he forgives us fully, permanently, and unconditionally. That's a good word. Amen. Thank you all. That's a good word. I say amen with the sisters this morning. Amen. Whoever else said amen. Warren Wiersbe said this. I love what he said. This is why we should forgive others. At the end of this quote, listen to this. He said, an unforgiving spirit is the devil's playground. And before long, it becomes the Christian's battleground. If somebody hurts us, either deliberately or unintentionally, and we do not forgive him, then we begin to develop bitterness within, which hardens the heart. We should be tender-hearted and kind, but instead we are hard-hearted and bitter. Actually, we are not hurting the person who hurt us. We are only hurting ourselves. Bitterness in the heart makes us treat others the way Satan treats them, when we should treat others the way God has treated us. Wow. He said, in his gracious kindness... God has forgiven us, and we should forgive others. We do not forgive for our sake, though we do get a blessing from it, or even for their sake, but for Jesus' sake, we forgive. Christ the Lord, our debt has paid, all our sins on him were laid. We, like him, should try to live always ready to forgive. Have you been forgiven by God this morning? Rejoice in it. Don't hold that forgiveness in. Relay it to others. If you've not come to Jesus and through Jesus, then you've not been forgiven by God. The only way God can forgive sin is through his son, Jesus. See, Jesus came, our debt to pay, saved our soul in grace one day. So in love, we all should live ready always to forgive. When it seems you can't forgive, remember how much you've been forgiven. Think about that. Think about that. What, what you've been forgiven, what it cost God to forgive you. He's forgiven us of all of our wickedness and all of our worldliness and wantonness. He's forgiven all of every evil thought, action, and intention. He's forgiven all of our years of rebellion and rejection and uh, uh, resistance. He's forgiven all our angries and adulteries and, and, and attacks. He's forgiven all of our covetousness and carnality and corruption. He's forgiven all of our idolatry and impurities and iniquities. He's forgiven all of our hatred and hard-heartedness and harshness. He's forgiven it all. Corey Ten Boom. I don't know if you've read about her. Uh, they've got books about Corey Ten Boom. Listen, to, she spent years in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II. Listen to this. While in prison, Corey saw incredible abuse, so inhum inhumane that it drove the prisoners to, to incredible depths, including intentionally allowing lice to breed on their bodies. Because the more lice they had, the less chance the, uh, the, the uh, Roman, the, the German guards would molest them. Corey even witnessed the death of her own sister, Betsy, in that concentration camp. After the world, 
war, God sent Corey Tim Boone on a mission of mercy through the warm tour of cities to encourage residents to choose forgiveness rather than bitterness. She would, uh, she was uh, motivate her audience in, in her testimony by sharing some of the atrocities that had ex they had experienced, implying that she, if she, she, uh, if she could forgive the horrors of what she went through, then her listeners could forgive as well. One night after she gave a testimony, a man walked up to her and she recognized as he approached Corey, he was a guard at the prison camp. And he said to Corey, Frolin, you don't know me, but I was a guard in one of those camps. After the war, God saved me. I wish I could go back and undo those years. I can't, but I've just been prompted by God to come tonight and ask you, would you please forgive me? Then he extended to her his hand. And can you imagine the horrible thoughts and memories that raced through Corey's mind? And she recognized his face and even worse, heard of his incredible plea for forgiveness. How could she do this? Corey said her arms froze at her side and she was literally unable to move. The flashbacks in her mind replaying the atrocities, the death of her sister, the abuse. And then God's spirit said to her, Corey, what have you been telling everyone else to do? An act of your will, will you choose to forgive? Corey went on to explain what happened next. She said, I reached out my hand and I put my hand in his hand and I said, you are forgiven. She later reported that at that moment it was like a dam that broke loose. All the bitterness and resentment and God set me free is what she said. Some of, the, some of you today may need to be set free from bitterness and wrath and anger. Are you living by the Spirit? Are you trusting in the Son of God? Do you have bitterness towards anyone? Confess it today. Repent of it. Do you have wrath in your life? Are you known for, man, I'm, I'm on, right on the edge of blowing up all the time. Or do you harbor anger in your life? Are you loud and boisterous? Are you full of clamor? Shouldn't be in a Christian's life. Let the Holy Spirit take these things from you today. Do you have evil and malice in your hearts? Do you speak evil of anyone? Repent today. Christians, repent. And let's re be restored. Let's ask God the Holy Spirit to move in our midst, in our place, draw people to himself, be freed up to work. I don't want to be guilty of quenching the Holy Spirit in my life or his church. Are you kind today, compassionate towards others? Are you tender-hearted and caring for the needs of others? Are you forgiven of others when they sin against you? Listen to this. Do you seek forgiveness from others that you sin against? Have you remembered the example of God's forgiveness, the extent of his forgiveness? Christ paid it all on the cross for us. Let us rejoice in him. Let us live for him. Let us not grieve the Holy Spirit. Let us live life by the Spirit. If you're here this morning, you don't have life. If you don't have the Spirit, you don't have life. You might have physical life. You're breathing. I don't see nobody dead here this morning. Check the aisles, Brother Bob. Does anybody lay down? <laughs> but if you've not been born again, you don't have life. The Bible says we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2. I've preaching, been preaching through the book of Ephesians. He addressed that. But what happens when we come to Jesus? We receive life. We receive the Holy Spirit, and he begins to work in us and work on us. He was working on those Ephesians. That's why Paul was commanding them, put these things out of your life. Let them be put away. Let the Holy Spirit work. He's got all power in heaven on earth. He's God the Spirit, and God lives in us if we're saved. Well, let's live like it. Amen. Let's pray this morning. If you've not been saved today, you can trust Jesus right where you are. You can call upon him, ask him to forgive you of all your sins. Recognize you're a lost sinner, that you're one breath away from eternity in hell. Jesus came so you wouldn't have to die and go to hell. And we're going to have to die because we have sin, but we, we got eternal life. So when I take step out of this body, I'm going to be in heaven. To be out of the body to be in the presence of the Lord. If you don't have that promise today, you can. You can receive Jesus today by trusting in him and calling on him, asking him to forgive you of your sin Asking him to cleanse you of your sin and give you eternal life. He's a giving God. He wants to give you eternal life. He don't want anyone to perish. And that includes you. That included me, thank God. Call upon him today. The Bible said that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'll call on Jesus right where you are in faith, he'll save you. Some of you need to call on Jesus in faith today. He's already saved you, but you've not been living like it. You need to repent. He allows you turns, amen. God allows us when we get on the wrong road, wrong path, going the wrong way. He wants us to do a U-turn, get back with him. 
If you've not been close to Jesus, I'm going to tell you, he hadn't left you. If somebody's left, it hadn't been him. Would you return to Jesus today? Father, would you bless and draw people to yourself in this place today? Lord, let us all live by the Spirit. And God, to do that, we have to have the Spirit. And I pray for those in this place today that have never been born again, that today they would call upon the name of Jesus and be saved by the grace of God. Lord, they would trust in the resurrected Son of God who paid it all. Thank you, Lord, for the extent of that forgiveness, Lord, the, the example that you give, Lord, that you extended forgiveness to us through the offer and the sacrifice of your only begotten Son. Lord, we rejoice in you today. We thank you for our salvation. And God, help us to live life by the Spirit. I pray that men and women... God would obey your word. And the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, we'd put away all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking. And Lord, all malice out of our lives. That we'd live by the Spirit. That the world would take note, God, that we've been changed. And that we'd just be brag on Jesus. Yes, it's, we just brag on Jesus, Lord. It's, it's the work of grace in our lives. The work of the Spirit in our lives. I pray the Holy Spirit would be freed up to move in this place, Lord. That God would not hinder the Holy Spirit by rebellion and disobedience in our lives. Lord, let us remember our lives make a difference individually in our homes, in our marriages, in your church, with our family, with our neighbors. And would you use your church, Lord, use your people. Lord, unite your people in the Holy Spirit that we might live for your glory. Draw people to yourself in this invitation time, Lord, is my prayer. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me all over the building? We're going to.